and welcome back to this uh, 11th lecture of uh, microsystems fabrication by advanced manufacturing processes. So, so far uh, we were looking into the mechanical processes like uh, abrasive jet machining, powder blasting, um, also USM, ultrasonic machining and we did those processes uh, from a fundamental standpoint um, and uh, then also model very uh, various important issues like uh, material removal rate or surface average surface roughness etcetera. And uh, then also try to understand the direct applications of such processes in the micro systems business uh, where micro devices <laughs> are manufactured from uh, these mechanical so called uh, energy processes. Today we will be uh, looking into a slightly different aspect uh, into the electrochemical machining that is another very important non conventional uh, machining process or fabrication process very widely used again in the microsystems fabrication. And uh, as the name suggests uh, electrochemical has a component uh, of electricity and uh, is also related to the chemical aspect which means essentially it is a ion transport. So, uh, as any other electrochemical process would be this machining also involves the transport the, <coughs> the material removal getting removed by means of displacement through ions into an electrolyte solution. You need uh, conducting surfaces for such uh, uh, machining operations. And then the idea is that instead of depositing on the tool side if supposing the ions that emanate out of the workpiece material they can be somehow precipitated uh, into a state which is undissolvable. Uh, so, they can be like debris and by circulating the electrolyte you can carry away those uh, materials away uh, from the main work zone and that way you can do bulk micro machining uh, by using electrochemical operations. So, let us look uh, uh, this process at this process from a fundamental standpoint as we always normally do. So, it is one of the again uh, electrochemical machining is one of the most uh, uh, sort of wanted un, un, con, unconventional processes uh, that are uh, existing. Uh, the process is a reverse of electro plating some minor modifications and again it is based on the principle of electrolysis that can be seen from the, uh, the way that the process is described. So, as uh, you already know that in a metal in a piece of metal electricity is uh, typically uh, conducted by free electrons, okay. but in the solution the, the electricity actually gets converted uh, or the electricity gets carried by uh, ions. Okay. So, in metal uh, on one side the electrons are kind of bound within the clutches of the nucleus formulating sometimes part of a large cloud electron cloud which moves around the various orbitals, but in solution the, the major current uh, you know uh, comes out of the ions and the mobility of those ions in the solution. So, that is the major charge carrier uh, positive ions and negative ions cations and anions in a solution. So, the flow of a current in an electrolyte always is accompanied uh, by movement of matter okay, as opposed to what typically would happen in metallic conductors where it is really the electron or the hole in the vacancy which is moving around and that results in a current. And somehow this movement of uh, current on an external uh, circuit should be somehow balanced to the movement of uh, charge carriers or ions in the solution for creating a continuous process or continuous state of operation. And so, electrochemical machining is to establish that kind of a continuous operation where charge carriers on the solutions are kind of neutralized by the electrons and holes carried from the uh, in, in the external circuit of uh, such a process. So, uh, as you can see here back in the slide in the ECM process the workpiece is connected to the positive electrode. So, it is made the anode and the tool to the negative terminal for the metal removal. Okay. So, that is conventionally uh, followed in some of these processes. So, tool is the <coughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the cathode and the workpiece is the anode as you can see in this figure here. And uh, one good point uh, that I would like to mention here is that it is a die sinking process meaning thereby that whatever is the profile of uh, the tool however complicated the profile of the tool may be is kind of uh, 
impinged or impregnated into the workpiece surface eventually because of the uh, the, uh, the you know improper distribution of the electric field to begin with okay so electric field as you all are aware is basically the gradient of potential and the distances as you can see between this and this is quite large okay so the sides here of the tool are at a much higher distance thereby meaning that the electric field here is lower okay and uh, the uh, the electric field here is very very high uh, as can also be illustrated by these field lines okay you can see the density of the lines closer to the interface which is closer of the tool surface in comparison to the sides so therefore uh, it is obvious to assume that if uh, by faraday's principle we assume the material removal rate mrr to be proportional to the uh, to the electric field somehow the field vectors are very high at the center and uh, sort of trace amounts at the sides which means thereby that the mrr from the central portion of the workpiece would be the highest okay so mrr is highest where the tool is closest okay and the mrr subsequently is lower as you move to the sides and uh, therefore uh, it is obvious to assume that the workpiece would kind of achieve a shape after a while where the electron electric field kind of gets homogenized and beyond which the whole shape the in the negative of the shape of the the tool electrode is impregnated and the ecm process gets carried out after that in the same shape uh, as uh, once this full impregnation and shape uh, of of the tool is embedded onto the workpiece surface so that's what the beauty of this ecm process is that it is a die sinking process so whatever shape you want to generate you create a negative of that shape as a tool and it automatically impregnates that shape finally on the workpiece <coughs> so this can be also uh, sort of more mathematically represented by the ohm's law okay so which is actually followed here v equal to ir potential is current into resistance and here uh, we just sort of modify this as rho um d over a where d is the distance between the two electrodes and a is the interfacial area okay between the uh the two electrodes and so therefore we can easily find out that b v by d which is nothing but the electric field so the magnitude of the electric field okay is actually equal to rho times of the current density so this actually is the magnitude of the current density okay and so therefore electric field is proportional to the current density meaning thereby that if current density is more uh, the electric field would be higher and vice versa so the current density definitely is more here in comparison to here okay because you have more amount of current uh, traveling for <coughs> uh, so so more so because because the because of the uh, increased electric field as can be seen here okay so you have uh, more amount of current density at the center because the e field is high and less amount of current density at the sides because the e field or the electric field is lower okay and uh, mrr of course as i told you before is proportional to the current density so therefore if e field is high meaning thereby the current density is high the mrr also is high and vice versa so that's how electrochemical machining is really performed and uh, uh, that's how you know <coughs> the die sinking nature of the ecm process comes so there are certain basic uh, fundamentals about this ecm electrochemical machining process uh, one of them is that the tool is provided with a constant feed motion and uh, as i already mentioned before that the whole idea is to somehow be able to precipitate whatever comes out of uh, the workpiece not the anode and uh, that precipitate can be circulated outside the work zone by uh, means of uh, the electrolyte which is a flowing or a moving electrolyte and that way the debris removal would mean that machining would happen so the electrolyte has to be therefore circulated so it is pumped uh, at a high pressure through the tool and the small gap between the tool and the workpiece uh, 
and the electrolyte so chosen is uh, such that the anode is dissolved, but there is no deposition on the cathode, meaning thereby that whatever <coughs> uh, properties the electrolyte has would let the anode <coughs> iron out, but also precipitate the ions released. So, a fundamental choice in any ECM system is to first be able to identify what electrolyte would do that uh, with what pair, with what paired electrode, okay, which would be the tool in turn. So, the order of uh, current and voltage uh, that are normally uh, found in such processes are a few thousand amps okay, current and about 8 to 20 volts uh, voltage and the gap. Uh, of the the ECM where the ECM is conducted between the tool and the workpiece is typically about uh, 100 to 200 microns, 0 0.1 to 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters. Uh, typical material removal rates can be about 1600 <coughs> millimeter cube per second for about 1 kilo amp current. Okay, so this is how uh, highly energy, uh, you know, so. Uh, so, it is a high energy process typically, energy densities are very, very high, specific uh, energy of the material is very high. And um, just some other factors figures approximately 3 kilowatt hour of power are needed to remove about 16,000 millimeter cube of metal. And this is about 30 times the energy required in any conventional process. So, in general we what we are seeing when, when we did this uh, mechanical processes or even now in electrochemical processes is that these non-conventional advanced machining processes are very highly energy intensive. So, the question is why do you use them? So, the first reason the, although the process is low yield is that you can more accurately uh, do surface finishing uh, and also if you can somehow constrain uh, the operations to a very small zone you can do micro machining very uh, wonderfully. Particularly uh, let us say for example, the modality involved in the ECM process would make it amenable to crevices or corners, which may not be otherwise uh, get machined or be able to get machined by a conventional process as such, which involves a metal to metal cutting. Okay. So, if supposing the shape complexity of the final uh, you know product that you want to make is huge, okay. some of these non conventional processes are really better uh, uh, choices over the conventional processes, even though the fact that the yield is low, even though the fact that the uh, the energy density which is needed for <coughs> removing a certain volume of metal may be very high, uh, energy required may be very high and energy density may be higher. So, uh, uh, still do people do use because of uh, shape complexities, because of surface finishes, particularly in micro systems design sometimes very complex shapes need to be fabricated uh, and, and there is no other choice left apart from some of these non conventional ways and means of fabricating. So, that is the reason why non conventional processes go hand in hand with manufacture of micro systems or micro machined systems so on so forth. So, let us look at uh, <coughs> some of the other aspects of ECM as uh, we have already illustrated here uh, uh, the electrolyte has to be flowed somehow between the tool and the, uh, the work piece and the best way to do that is to sort of coaxially move the electrolyte as you can see here this electrolyte is being moved through this uh, coaxial tube, which is actually present at the center of the tool. And uh, there also needs to be provided some insulation at the sides of the tool, tool to ensure that uh, the machining is not done sideways. Okay? The machining is only done in this vertical manner. And then of course, uh, this, this, this tool should have constant feed motion. Uh, so, there has to be a precise control on the feed motion of the tool. And then of course, the electrolyte which is splashed needs to be collected and re circulated back into the pumping system. So, that the debris which moves along with it can also go and does not does not clog uh, the gap the very small gap between the workpiece and the, the tool. <coughs> so, with the ECM the, the advantages are that the rate of metal removal is independent of the workpiece hardness. Okay. Uh, so, the, the workpiece may be of any hard hardness value there is no uh, scribing as such which is involved or there is no ploughing action which is involved. So, it is not mechanical and therefore, uh, the dissolution is really a property which is electrically dependent uh, and you need not have a higher force typically to 
remove the material which may happen in a conventional process. So, hardness does not matter here, any kind of hardnesses can be machined amenably, because all the, the basic principle is dissolution, dissolution because of ions coming out of the surface. So, it becomes advantageous when uh, the either the work material possesses very low machinability or the shape machine to be machined is complex. Uh, so, this I have emphasized uh, greatly in the last slide and unlike most other conventional and unconventional processes uh, here there is practically no tool wear. Okay. Although that is not true really, because sometimes uh, great pressures get generated into this small gap here, which may be a reason for tool deformation even if not wear. But the idea is that because <coughs> there is no deposition on the tool as such or there is no change in the characteristic of the tool as such, whatever comes out of the work piece uh, goes into the solution and gets precipitated and this precipitate is getting carried away. So, the tool should be left alone by and large by this process and the wear of the tool uh, is not is, is minuscule actually. So, uh, so, though it appears that since machining is done electrochemically, the tool experiences no force, <coughs> uh, the fact is uh, that the tool and work are subjected to large forces and we will do some design problems later where we will try to find out whether these forces are in consonance with the ultimate uh, flow stress sigma of uh, the tool side, which would give you a uh, feasibility or non feasibility of the process in question. So, we will do some of these design examples when uh, we discuss this in some more details later in electrochemical machining. <coughs> so, let us now look at uh, a little bit of modeling about how uh, you know material removal in such a ECM process, electrochemical machining process, can be uh, predicted. Okay, and so, the basic uh, theory th theories which come to our mind or the basic uh, formulations which come to our mind are the Faraday's laws of electrolysis. So, uh, let us see what those uh, two laws are. So, fundamentally which governed this whole machining process as uh, this is as good as any other electrochemical business. So, the Faraday's laws are pretty much valid in the machining also. So, one uh, the first Faraday's law uh, says that the amount of chemical change produced by an electric current. Uh, that is the amount of any material dissolved or deposited. Okay. So, that is essentially what the current is going to do, okay. either carry out ions or deposit ions to the electrodes. That is proportional to the quantity of electricity that is passed. So, if current is higher, the current that is passed is higher, the amount of chemical change produced by the electric current will also be higher, which typically means the material dissolved. or the material deposited would also be higher. Okay. So, that is the first law and the second uh, Faraday's uh, principle or law of electrolysis says that the amount of uh, amounts of different substances dissolved or deposited by the same quantity of electricity uh, are proportional to their chemical equivalent weights. Okay. And this chemical equivalent lay weight as we will just see a little bit later is basically the uh, uh, is a function of the total atomic weight and also the function of the valency state in which it has to be moved. So, if it is moving by plus 2, uh, the chemical equivalent weight would be the atomic weight by 2, okay, so on and so forth. So, it is a function of the, the valency at which the ion is coming out and also a function of the atomic weight. So, the amount of different substances uh, dissolved or deposited by the same quantity of electricity are proportional to their chemical equivalent weights. So, in quantitative form the Faraday's two laws can be stated here that uh, the mass uh, the weight in grams of a material dissolved or deposited okay, is proportional to the current in amperes. Okay. So, I is from here uh, the time for which this current flows time in seconds and this gram equivalent epsilon or weight of the material which is actually equal to the atomic weight per unit the valency of the material. So, atomic weight can be obtained from the periodic table and this uh, valency states can be multifarious. There can be plus 2, plus 3, plus 1 states or maybe you know minus 1, minus 2 states. And so, basically <laughs> one has to be aware of at what stage this is a electrochemical dissolution is happening. Is it a divalent dissociation? Is it a trivalent or a uh, those kind of things have to be uh, taken care of while doing electrochemical machining. So, uh, let us actually look at a little uh, a slightly different aspect of uh, uh, this uh, theory and uh, what I would like to now uh, go ahead and uh, work out is how 
ions or how solutions would behave uh, at the interface of or uh, interfacial boundary of a of a solid and a solution. Okay. So, whenever there is a solid which is uh, immersed in a solution, there is almost always the formulation of a certain layer of charges which is also known as the dual layer of charges. So, automatically uh, by tendency by, you know by, by their natural tendencies, the, the metal which you are immersing in a solution would try to bleed out ions and it would uh, retain electrons and there would be an ion electron uh, pair which is thus generated with the ion floating in the solution and the electron on the electrode. And then there is going to be a very thin layer of uh, a dielectric high dielectric like water which is separating both these ions and electrons and not allowing them to intermingle again once they have been liberated. So, each ion thus formulated has a bunch of water molecules around it okay, and it does not let the ion go back and take the electron uh, from the, the metal surface. So, <coughs> it is very important to somehow see the characteristics of such ions may be positive and negative in a solution and how they are transported. And uh, uh, such a transport theory was uh, for the first time proposed by uh, you know uh, which, which came as Debye Huckel theory of ion transport. And so, basically we want to uh, look into that aspect before starting with electrochemical machining because a corollary of that uh, which is the zeta potential of any surface is very important for the process of uh, electrochemical machining. So, let us see what happens when uh, strong electrolytes are completely ionized and their ions are not entirely free to move independently uh, of one another through the body of a solution except when this is infinitely dilute. Okay. So, the following uh, situations may happen. So, let us say there are positive ions in this and there are a bunch of different negative ions and each of these positive ions are formulating a cloud of negative ions around it. Okay something like this. So, these are cloud of negative ions around it. So, uh, the first uh, effect that one can imagine intuitively is that the ions will move randomly with respect to each other due to fairly violent thermal motion. Okay. So, this is also the Brownian movement that the ions would move due to their ambient thermal energy which is uh, a function of the temperature state at which they are in they would actually move randomly with respect to each other. And uh, then there are going to be coulombic forces between opposite kinds of ions like for example, in this case let us say the positive charge centers and the negative cloud around it of negative ions around it. There are going to be coulombic forces of attraction okay, uh, which would lead essentially to the assembly of these charge clouds around the positive central charge systems or vice versa. So, <coughs> this kind of leads to uh, a time averaged ion atmosphere of one kind with respect to a central ion of the opposite kind. In this case, it is a positive central ion and the time averaged atmosphere is a negative ion. And this is the distribution which will almost always happen when you pour uh, you know such a ion pair or an ionic solid into uh, the governed by coulombic forces into a solution like NaCl in water. Okay. So, Na plus and Cl minus and then water comes in between. So, water molecules kind of because they are high dielectric they get into uh, and in, in engulf the the na plus and the cl minus and they don't they seldom allow them to come together but then what can happen is because there is an overall positive charge center in the na plus and overall negative charge center in cl minus there can be a assembly in a manner so that there is an average atmosphere of cl minus around na plus or vice versa okay so that's uh, what we are meaning by this columbic forces and then uh, supposing you make an external electric field applied to such a system uh, where this let us say is the positive side, this is the negative side. So, all the negative ions will start moving in the positive end uh, and the positive ions of course, will start to move in the in the negative side. And therefore, movement of <coughs> such ions under an external electric field first of all will be very slow okay. and uh, the atmosphere. Uh, starts moving in the opposite direction as in this case you can see the negative ion atmosphere moves to the positive side and the negative the, the positive uh, central ions start moving to the opposite that is the negative side uh, of this 
field or potential which is created by two electrodes. So, uh, therefore, there would be a continuous disruption and reformulation. in the ion atmospheres with respect to the central ions. So, for example, when they start moving these uh, negative ions are going to get reformulated in the cloud of this second positive ion right. From first positive ion it moves to the second positive ion so on so forth. So, therefore, there is an assemblage of charges which kind of disrupted from the ionic environment of ion 1 into the ionic environment of ion 2 and vice versa and so that happens all the way throughout the solution. So, therefore, uh, there may be many effects like electrophoretic effect which is essentially the movement of the charges uh, across uh, a medium uh, over a potential externally applied to the system okay. and there can be also viscous drag of the atmosphere because mind you these all uh, moieties charged moieties are present in solution. Okay. So, therefore, if the positive center is moving ahead and the negative center is trying to move in the opposite direction, it is obvious that there would be viscous effects or there would be shear between the layers uh, of the solution which is containing these ions in turn. So, there would be a viscous drag which is associated with the, the, the forward motion of the ion through this whole uh, so called atmosphere. So, all these parameters need to be included in a model uh, where we can really estimate what would happen to the, the layer of moiety which is formulated uh, across a metal electrode. Okay. So, let us look at how we will be able to in a simplified manner model uh, a such a situation in a solution. So, let us look into the, the formulation of this sort, sort of ion transport equation uh, which is also known as the debye huckel equations. So, let us suppose that so there is a positive charge and uh, a single positive charge and it has a uh, environment made up of both positive and negative charges and uh, at a distance of at an infinite distance uh, from this charge the charge density of the positive uh, the number density of the positive or the negative charges of uh, the environment of this positive charge are n plus 0 and n minus 0 per unit volume right. So, this is the positive or negative charge number density meaning thereby number per unit volume of this ion of interest central ion of interest which is a positive charge. So, supposing if we uh, were to find out a point A here in the near vicinity of uh, this positive charge this central positive charge of interest here uh, the amount of work that and, and let us say at particular A there is existing uh, potential xi def, uh, defined by a function. So, this xi is the potential at a point near the central charge. Okay. So, the work done for a positive by the system okay, for let us say moving a positive charge uh, is, is actually given by uh, the charge itself. Let us say the charge has a valence z plus. So, z plus times of electronic charge epsilon this epsilon as you all know is 1.6 10 to the power of minus 19 coulomb electronic charge. right? So, the total charge on the ion times of the potential. Similarly, uh, the work done for moving a negative charge 
from distance infinity where xi is 0 actually all the way to this point a. Okay. So, from for moving a positive charge from infinity to a negative charge moving a negative charge from infinity to a would then be given by minus z minus epsilon xi xi is the potential at a z minus is the valency on the negative ion okay and e of course as you know is the electronic charge so that's the amount of work which is done in case of a positive charge or a negative charge to come from infinity to the point a close to the central ion of interest now if we uh, look at so therefore there would be a possibility of uh, a charge distribution at the point a which can now be given as n plus and n minus okay and uh, these mind you are numbers per unit volume number of positive charges per unit volume number of negative charges per unit volume. So, uh, we are concluding here that the ion which is the central ion of interest is assembling its own charge atmosphere around it and at a point A the numbers are n plus and n minus of positive and negative charges per unit volume assuming that at point uh, in space which is infinite distance from the central ion the negative the, the distribution of the positive and negative ions are n plus 0 and n plus n plus uh, n minus is 0 uh, in terms of numbers of charges per unit volume okay so and we already know what is the work done for moving one charge of a certain value of a certain charge from infinity to a so there is a correlation which exists and i'm not going into the details of that correlation between uh, you know the numbers which are at the point A uh, to the numbers which are far away or at infinite distance from the point A. So, that uh, correlation actually emanates out of the Boltzmann uh, distribution. So, from Boltzmann distribution, the n plus a 0 a number density near the point A is actually equal to uh, n plus 0 at an infinity times of exponential to the power of minus the total amount of work which is done. So, z plus epsilon xi by k t and uh, this is also a function of the absolute temperature in which the system is stalled and similarly the n minus uh, at the point A mind you these are number densities at point A these are number densities at infinity point infinity. So, n minus 0 e to the power of z minus epsilon phi psi by k t. So, k is the Boltzmann constant and uh, n plus or n minus are the numbers per unit volume near or at a n plus 0 n minus 0 numbers per unit volume at infinity or at infinite distance. So, the total electrical density the total electrical uh, charge density near A or at A can be given as the numbers per unit volume at A times of the amount of charges let us assume the charge on one ion is z plus epsilon okay minus the number of negative 
charges per unit volume times the value of the charge z minus e on the negative ion. If we substitute the values of n plus and n minus from this set of equation 1 earlier, we can get this as n plus 0 z plus epsilon times of e to the power of minus z plus epsilon psi by k t minus of n minus 0 z minus epsilon times of e to the power of z minus epsilon psi by k t. So, that is the electrical charge density at the point A. And uh, if we just apply Taylor series here and just assume that uh, the higher orders are negligible. Okay. x square by factorial 2 plus so on so forth and we assume that the higher orders because of the low value of x are negligible. We can write this equation number 2 in the following manner. So, you have uh, rho at A, the overall charge density at A written as n plus 0 z plus epsilon times of 1 minus z plus epsilon xi by k t okay. or minus of n minus 0 z minus epsilon 1 minus z minus epsilon xi by k t. Okay? And therefore, this can further be written down as n plus 0 z plus epsilon minus n minus 0 z minus epsilon minus of n plus 0 z plus epsilon square xi by k t minus of n minus 0 z minus epsilon square xi by k t. So, this of course, is 0 because uh, at infinite distance we can assume the principle of electron neutrality to exist. and this becomes 0 right and so the other term which can be taken care of is basically minus n plus 0 z plus epsilon square by k t minus n minus 0 z minus epsilon square by k t times of xi. Okay? So, if we assume uh, that the charge densities of the positive and negative kinds are same at infinity, which is absolutely true because of again the principle of electronegativity, electron neutrality coming into existence. And this we assume to be equal to let us say n i. Okay. So, we formulate a system where i is a set of all positive and negative charges. Let us say i varying between 1 and n, meaning thereby if it is exactly half 1 to n by 2. Uh, can be uh, the positive charges and by 2 to n can be the negative charges, so on and so forth. So, therefore, uh, we can write down this uh, charge density equation rho a as in a very simplistic manner as sigma n i z i square. Now, I am actually getting rid of all these pluses and minuses in the subscripts and represent, uh, representing them by i's. Okay. So, n i z i square, square of epsilon times of potential function xi by k t. So, that is the density of the charges, the overall charges at uh, a point A in space close to the central ion of interest. 
So, we somehow need to be able to derive the, the potential function which exists at A near that central ion of interest owing to the charge density which is around it. And uh, in the next step, what we are going to do is to utilize the Poisson's equation uh, in, in the space uh, coordinates and try to find out uh, that at least in the CGS system, the, the gram centimeter uh, second system, how this uh, equation can be used for determining the, the electrical field at a point A because of the, the, uh, the complete amount of positive and negative charges with densities n uh, and i, where i varies between all the positive and negative charges close to the central line of interest. So, uh, the electrostatic potential and charge density are uh, related by the Poisson's equation. as del 2 xi by del x 2 plus del 2 xi by del y 2 plus del 2 xi by del z 2. This is the special uh, all, all second derivatives uh, space derivatives and that is actually equal to minus 4 pi charge density which is actually the charge density at A okay, rho at A by the dielectric constant. Here uh, xi is the potential at A, rho is the charge density at A, and D is the dielectric constant of the medium. Okay. So, we want to somehow be able to solve for this equation. Uh, to find out a relationship between xi and all these other terms like charge density, dielectric constant and of course, of course uh, this uh, space term. Uh, so, that um, you know uh, xi can come as a function of um, uh, the, uh, the spatial variation and also the variation of the charge density between different shells around the central line of interest. So, uh, what we will uh, try to do is to just uh, use a simple conversion technique to convert uh, this whole uh, you know equation into polar coordinates. Okay. So, here what we assume is because there is a central ion and uh, you know uh, potential function really varies as a function of distance r from the central ion. And uh, so, somehow we have to convert this whole equation into polar coordinates or spherical coordinates. Okay. And then assume only variation along of the radius vector r or we assume spherical symmetry So, I am not going to go into the derivation of it, but the approach can be represented here. Let us say you have a Cartesian coordinate system. Okay x, y, z and you have a radius vector here r. So, you have uh, the first projection of the radius vector as uh, on the x, y plane. By, uh, so, this can be projected by let us say an angle gamma. So, this component here is r cos gamma and this component here is r sin gamma. And then if you rotate this at an angle let us say theta. So, the x component can out come out to be r cos gamma sin theta and y component can come out to be r cos gamma sin theta or uh, cos theta I'm sorry cos theta and then of course you know that the z component is already r sin gamma okay so if you were to change this whole form of poisson's equation into polar coordinates, you will have to just uh, represent xi by differentiating with respect to r, gamma and theta okay, using the chain rule and uh, then assume 
spherical symmetry. So, the variation that you are assuming is only along r. So, this whole equation now gets converted or changed into the form 1 by r square del by del r times of square of r times del 2 or del xi by del r. Okay. And this is equal to minus 4 pi rho by d. So, this is the uh, spherical coordinates or you know this is the equation in spherical coordinates or polar coordinates assuming that there is a spherical symmetry and there is no variation along the angle gamma or theta the only variation is along the radius vector r. So, we want to now be able to solve this so that xi comes as a function of r rho dielectric constant d so on so forth and it is very amenable for us to now try to find out what is the work done by a charge at infinity to come very close to the surface. Uh, in question, which is actually A, where the potential is xi. So, here uh, let us try to uh, solve this differential equation, which has been obtained 1 by r square del by del r times of square of r del xi by del r equal to minus uh, 4 pi rho by d. And uh, we already know that the rho has been illustrated before in uh, an equation which you formulated earlier as minus uh, n i z i square square of epsilon uh, potential function xi by k t. So, therefore, this can be represented as 1 by r square del by del r times of or del by del r of r square del xi by del r. Okay is minus 4 pi by d and the minus goes away n i z i square epsilon square xi by k t. Okay. So, if you were to just take this uh, portion stand alone and consider this to be uh, square of small k, the capital K of course, here as you are seeing is the Boltzmann constant. So, we will not go into that it's a small k. So, the small k square can be represented as 4 pi d sigma n i z i square epsilon square by Boltzmann's constant capital K times of t. Let this be equation 3 okay. uh, and we can represent this equation 1 by r square del by del r of uh, r square del xi by del r as square of moles k Small, uh, small k times of uh, potential function xi. Okay. So, this of course, is a standard uh, equation uh, with the standard solution and there is also a uh, you know, general differential equation. It is not partial anymore because only one variable is involved and uh, uh, the solution to this the standard solution to this comes out as xi equal to some constant a times of e to the power of minus small k r by r plus some constant a dash times of e to the power of small k r by r. So, that is how the standard solution of this equation comes out as. So, we will take the solution and try to investigate what these values of a and a dash r a prime r based on the boundary conditions that are imposed to on uh, to us through this problem. So, here uh, the first condition that we can actually think of is that the potential function xi is actually 0 at r equal to infinity right and therefore, so xi infinity is 0. So, if you consider xi to be equal to a e to the power of minus k r by r plus a dash e to the power of plus k r by r. Okay. Uh, meaning thereby that if supposing this whole xi uh, equal to 0 be true at r equal to infinity a dash automatically becomes a 0. Otherwise, this term will uh, you know be undefined by undefined. 
Uh, of course, here because it is e to the power minus k r as r increases to infinity, this term goes very small and so therefore overall the equation can be 0. Uh, so, therefore, a dash is 0 from the boundary conditions okay? and uh, xi becomes equal to uh, the constant a to the power of or e to the power of minus k r by r. So, that is a solution for the potential function at a close to the central line of interest which is a to the power of minus k r by r. So, we already know that uh, from the previous uh, equation that charge density had been earlier defined as uh, a function of uh, n i z i square epsilon square xi, okay, the potential function by Boltzmann constant k times of t. And so, we can actually substitute the value of xi that we have obtained here to obtain the charge density at space close to that point a as minus a e to the power of minus small k r sigma n i z i square epsilon square divided by Boltzmann constant k times of absolute temperature t times of r. Okay, Just a substitution. So, that is what the charge density value comes out to be. Or in other words, if we were to involve uh, small k into picture, and you know that small k was defined by equation 3 here. So, therefore, we can say that uh, this whole term can be written down as a small k square by 4 pi times of d e to the power of minus small k r by r. So, this way you can actually get rid of this whole complex uh, sigma uh, by k t r. Okay. So, that is how the charge density would equate to close to the central line of interest uh, at a point A very close to it. We will try to now uh, find out. Uh, so, so we, we are kind of coming at the end of this lecture, but in the next lecture we will try to find out what is the value of A uh, which we would like to investigate uh, and finally, the potential function will come out once the value of A uh, comes from a certain condition that uh, we would do in terms of principle of electron neutrality of charges around the central line of interest. So, with this we close today's lecture and uh, we will try to solve this or take it up and solve this further in the next lecture. Thank you.